Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Agency Freedom Podcast. We help insurance professionals move from captivity to freedom. Thanks for those of you who are watching us on our YouTube channel. Still trying to get that thing off the ground. Most people don't know it exists. So go check out the video episode on YouTube if that's your cup of tea. And if you like the traditional audio-only podcast, well, you're here already listening to this right now. So uh, welcome, sit back, relax, and enjoy. My guest for this episode is Mr. Cody Hauk, hailing from the great state of Arizona in the Phoenix area. Cody and I have known each other for a long time. We've been in several of the same circles over the years, and I reached out uh, a few weeks ago and was like, dude, let's get you on the pod. You're doing some cool things. Little did I know he's doing more cool things that would then come out even uh, between when I reached out and when we record this episode, by the time you listen to it a month or two from now, he will be well underway, just blowing and going in his new gig, his new partnership. I'll let him tell you all about that. Cody, thanks for being here, man. Yeah, James, man. Great to finally get on and do this with you, man. I know we've... Uh kind of flirted with it a few times and finally got some time to get this done. So <laughs> let's go, baby. Let's go. Why don't you start us off with your bio, man? I always love starting there. Whatever you think is important for us to know about the Cody Houck story, uh, how how in the world you got into insurance? Are you in a multi-generational or did you stumble in like most people? Uh, catch us up with, uh, with your story. Real unconventional, man. So, um, you know, long story, long personal story of a lot of trials, tribulations and and overcoming some challenges. And uh, I've dug into that on some other podcasts, but yeah, real unconventional route, not the, not the method you normally hear, but I had a strong background in logistics and operations and um, you know, we'll dive into to PSB a little later, but really rev ops in multiple industries before coming into insurance. Um, but jumped in under a captive environment uh, about seven years ago with one of my really good friends. He was looking for a producer and um Thought about insurance before, but decided to uh, to give it a shot and did really well there. Um, but like most in captive, especially working as a producer, realized I wasn't going to make any money unless my name was the one on the building. So after about a year and a half of that, um, got tired of it, went back to logistics and operations and I uh, worked for one of the largest dairy distributors in the Southwest. Um, they, they've moved into national now and then went into another rev op situation with a transportation company and helped them grow from, you know, I was there for 12 months and we went from 2 million in revenue and a 10% margin to four, seven and 22% in 12 months. Uh, wow. My contract was up there. I went in in a consulting role there and uh, decided, you know, let's give insurance a shot again. So actually took a role as a agency manager for a small brokerage here in Arizona. And that was about eight months before COVID. Um, and COVID came and that agency went out of business a few months later and s sold what it had left to another agency here in the Phoenix area and didn't know what quite to do at that point. So decided, you know what, let's, let's give my own shop a try. Yeah. So three years later, here we are. <laughs> Man, love that. You, uh, survival of the fittest, huh? You, you I, were on a, on a, a ship that was taking on water and you exited at the right time and you know, got into a new ship that is no longer taking on water. Uh, yeah. And that's been a long road itself, man. I mean, three years, three rebrands, trying to dial in the messaging and really learn what I wanted to do in the industry, right? Yep, absolutely. And so what do you want to do in the industry? That's the natural <laughs> question there, you know? What uh, What do you like to to do? What's What's your in? What What interests you in this industry that you and I both work in? So man, the last year and a half, the first year and a half, I, I just came in as a generalist writing any and everything I could, like a lot of people who were starting up from scratch and then realized, uh, you know, we'll go kind of, kind of cliche here. The riches are in the niches, right? You find what you want to do and really go 10 X on that. So decided to really shift away from personal lines altogether and dive into commercial and uh, focused real heavily on contractors and manufacturing here in Arizona. So started to dial in my brand and messaging around that. Um, and over the last, I don't know, nine months, that's just taken off like crazy and uh, gained a lot of traction here. And, and we've become the go-to for contractors insurance in Arizona. Love it. Are there are particular trades that you like to focus on. Are you niche down to that level or is it just skilled contractors in general? So I do a lot of, of GCs. Um, both on the residential and, and getting into the commercial side, mm -hmm. uh, have several roofer, really good roofing contracts and, uh, 
and get, getting into some really good HVAC and plumbing. So everything that you're doing in the roofers is is going to be ENS, right? Unless you're on the commercial side, right? Oh, yeah. The yeah, only especially admitted here in roofer we have is the NRCA program with CNA. Uh, that's, you know, the national program. That's the yeah. only admitted one we have. We're not big enough to have a Zurich contract. Zurich has a nice roofing program, but that's for the the really big ones. Yeah, I'm I'm really heavy in ENS here. When you get into contractors in here in Arizona with uh with just the labor force that's here and the the way that these companies have done business for years and years, it it I mean it's automatically going to ENS a lot of times. Lots and lots of under the table subs, huh? Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you basically have uh, a huge border problem there. Not nearly as bad as we have it in Texas, unfortunately. But um, yeah, labor in Arizona is a different animal. That's for sure. That, that's for sure, man. And I was blessed whenever I, I decided to go this route that I got connected with a really, really solid ENS broker that that held my hand along the way. I remember the first time I sent him <laughs> sent him a submission with the Accords. He called me right away. He's like, uh, "You've never done this before, have you?" <laughs> <laughs> that's always a good conversation no do you you have any favorite wholesalers you want to give a shout out to anybody that uh, we need to be aware of i'm going to give a huge shout out to westpac in colorado man those guys are absolutely phenomenal eric richter and jake gowns have done a, an amazing job in building their team there my my broker i work with is steve brown um I mean, he he's held my hand along the way through my, my my journey learning how to write commercial and especially all the nuances of ENS. And it's been I, I attribute a lot of my success to to him having that patience with me and being willing to do that. Awesome. Love hearing that, man. Uh, the, it, it's always fun when you can find an underwriter who wants to play ball and is happy to be a, you know, a teammate, a collaborator. And we have a yeah. handful of those as well. And you know, it seems like every year I'm trying to get rid of wholesalers and <laughs> consolidate relationships and, you know, book roll stuff to other wholesalers. So and I mean, at this point, we only have three wholesalers that we actively work with. And yeah. it used to be like six or seven. Yeah, I'm pretty much down to two myself. Love it. It makes life a lot easier because you know exactly what each of the three are good at. You're not sending submissions to the other two because you know that, you know, one of those three is going to be dialed in for whatever the risk is. And like you said, the riches are in the niches. Yep. So what what else is on your plate, man? What are you up to these days? Oh, man, just a major evolutions going on, man. Before, uh, huge thing before Christmas, as you can see, not my brand shirt that I'm wearing here. Um, started some conversation. I've been working with Mick Hunt. He's been one of my coaches. I, I met him around the same time I met you a few years ago. Um, him and I have stayed pretty close and and built a coach client relationship and more of a friendship these days. And we were talking a little before Christmas and uh, you know, everybody that knows Mick is aware of the the growth he's experienced there at PSB and the, the move he's making with insight and some of the things that are going on there. And uh, you know, he, he needed to grow the team and, and he's watched my personal growth over the last couple of years and know my background on the operation side and the rev op side as well. So we got to talking a little before Christmas and uh, he asked if I'd be willing and interested to, to come onto the team here at, at PSB. Um, and things have evolved there pretty fast. So I'm moving into uh, rev ops consulting and sales ops consulting with, with agencies across the country um, and doing a lot of work on our new uh, online learning platform, uh, Patty premier agency development Institute, um, where we are just incredibly excited about what we have going on there. Um, you know, get, I'm sure you experience it and see it all over the place. A, a huge missing piece is just practical commercial insurance knowledge and how to start writing commercial insurance yep. from marketing to submitting, uh, to underwriting, to binding, to how do you service it? Right. It's questions we're seeing everywhere, especially as people are making that shift in the market right now from the disaster that the personal lines market is across the country. <laughs> oh, yeah. In every everybody's market, wanting to get in every corner line. of the country. I mean, there's never been a bigger influx into agents wanting to write commercial in yeah. my 13 years in the business. Uh, it's, it's like every single personal lines agent from here to Timbuktu is going, hmm, what about commercial? Mm hmm. I mean, life and health was always a, a, a low hanging fruit for diversifying your book, getting additional streams of revenue. But most of the personal lines agents out there kind of poo pooed the idea of commercial. Not anymore, my friend. Now, unfortunately, commercial is not, you know, nirvana. It's not some escape route. 
uh, that gets you out of the hard market because there's plenty of hard market in commercial, of course, yeah. but it's not quite as impossible as personal lines is right now. Yeah. Yeah. So that was really our mission with that, man. And, and, you know, a lot of the training that is out there, some of it is really complex. You've got the designations that people can go get, but a lot of that education, if you try to dive into that right away, it's going to go right over your head. Yep. Uh, I know I struggled with that when I first started to, to try to obtain the designation designations and pursue those. Um, so we've built a very practical, affordable platform for people to come in and um, we're looking in the spring at launching what's going to be equivalent to uh, the CLCS designation course. We'll have that built in to our plat our PADI platform where people can come in and actually get a foundation of commercial coverage if they need it. Um, hmm. But then we have very in-depth niche education as well as to how to go after all the desirable niches that are out there. Love it. You know, the number of really high quality consultants uh, in the PNC insurance industry has skyrocketed in the last couple of years. Yeah. You know, a lot of agents and former agents that realize that they can have greater impact on the industry by you know teaching people what they've done from their own firsthand experience. I imagine you probably share my thoughts and feelings on how annoying it is with <laughs> this whack-a-mole of agents turned coaches and i'm like wait a second you were an agent for like 12 seconds what are you doing trying to m you know make money off of other agents doing coaching when you never actually did most of this yourself you're not speaking from firsthand experience like mick hunt is mr nationwide <laughs> himself um you probably find that even more annoying than i do and it's like wait a second you're you're a coach now i was like I'm looking at your LinkedIn and realizing you were not an agent for very long. I guess you're not a very good agent or else you wouldn't be jumping into coaching so quickly. Yeah, I think the I think the the unique thing with our approach, man, is is you know, we're trying to help agency owners get out of the I'm an insurance agency mindset into I'm a business mindset. Yep. Right? And yep. We see it a lot in the groups too, right? When people are talking about what should I sell my book for? How much should I buy this book for? Everybody always wants to refer to revenue and top line revenue whenever they're talking about acquisitions. When anyone who knows how the market has shifted, it's gone to EBITDA and looking more off that bottom line as to what your multiple is going to get, right? Yeah. So when we talk RevOps with agencies, that is what RevOps essentially is, is we are going to increase your EBITDA. So when you go to be acquired down the road, you're set up for that and can get the highest multiple that you can can achieve for your book. And that's where I more so focus in the business is on the rev op side because business, as I mentioned, business efficiency and consulting and operations is where I lived before coming into the industry. So I bring that aspect of it into the insurance world. And also, obviously I run an agency as well. So I have that hmm firsthand experience as to how that translates over to agency ownership. So we all live in our lanes, man. I mean, me and Mick really head the rev ops and sales ops for agencies. Um, we have Mike on our team who coaches producers and Mike was a quarter million dollar a year, new business revenue producer himself. So he, he was in it and knows what he's talking about when it comes to coaching producers. We've got Darius and Leslie on the team who are working with uh, account managers and our, our automations teams. So everybody sits in a seat where they have experience and, and have been there and done it. <laughs> hmm. Now, the obvious question, and I imagine that people in the listening audience, our freedom jumpers, as we like to call them, uh, <laughs> are probably leaning in and going, well, how are you doing this if you're still an agent? And you are still an agent, right? Oh, yeah. You, you're yep, still and running your agency. And, and, and yeah. How is all of that happening? Because last time I checked, you are stuck with the same 168 hours per seven days as the rest of us, right? How are you doing that? Honestly, man, it was really focusing on what my ideal client was and, and having a real laser sharp focus on the client I was bringing into my agency. Um, you know, my friend is a farmer's agent and him and I have equivalent size books. And he has 1,200 clients in his book and I have 100 and our book is the same. My service load is about three to four certs a week. <laughs> wow. So, you know, we, we've, we've dialed in some processes here. I've put automation in place that has really helped with that. I found some really, really awesome tech partners that help with, with back-end management. Um, 
Hmm. And I've got some amazing partners coming into the agency that not ready to let that cat out of the bag yet. But uh, yeah, we're about to bring in some heavy hitters to really, really pour some gas on this thing. <laughs> nice. Love it, man. I, I don't really know where to go in this conversation. There's so many different directions. What are you seeing in in your part of the country and the markets that you're serving? Obviously, we're still in the middle of a hard market. I love asking this question in every interview I do right now. Where are you finding the wins? How are you getting to the wins in a historically hard market that's lasting a lot longer than anybody thought it would? Uh, how are you succeeding right now? You know, man, the one thing that I've noticed out here is because of the hard market, everybody's more willing to have conversations, right? Their pain yep. point that you can easily get in and at least open the door is everybody thinks that there's a lower price out there because they're seeing increases. Well, then you get in the door and you start fighting past that price objection and you're uncovering service issues with where they're at, Yeah, right? Maybe, and, and people are even more willing to cut ties with their buddies that had insured them before than they ever have been before especially when you can get in and demonstrate that you have a little bit more industry knowledge and you can find cost savings for their business outside of insurance premiums. Yep. So I think really, honestly, man, the investments that I've made in myself over the last couple of years, whether that be an in industry knowledge, uh, outside sales coaches or marketing coaches that I've invested in to really help me grow the business, um, you know, health and fitness coaches that I've invested in that have helped me just really develop a level of discipline that I've never had. Uh, I think all of those things cumulatively have, have just really helped opportunities explode this year. Love it. You know, I, I love asking the question in the, the cold contact or the, uh, the marketing drop or whatever. Hey, other than selling you an insurance product and doing the baseline servicing of that product, What's your agent or broker doing? Like, are they making suggestions for other resources? Are they helping you with operational efficiencies? Are they helping you with loss controls or threat detection or mitigation plans or really anything like making sure that your business is better prepared for future threats? And, you know, nine times out of 10, there is no answer for that. Yeah. The, other, the other agent, the incumbent is doing nothing but placing insurance and collecting a commission which yeah. of course makes them immediately replaceable. And I almost want to thank them for being mediocre at their job because <laughs> it makes it so much easier to take away their accounts. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's kind of their fault, right? And 100%. some of you out there, uh, this should be a, a challenge. This should be a, a warning to you if you're not doing anything other than asking the right questions to gather information, to put a submission in front of an underwriter, sell an insurance policy and service it when the phone rings, that's not good enough anymore. And that's that's not going to be good enough as we move into the future. Generative AI is gonna be a massive disruptor. All these people coming into the industry with loss controls and all these other things, like there's a million different things that we could talk about that are adjacent to insurance, but they're not insurance. And there, there's going to be dozens of different factors that impact our ability to meet and close clients and keep the clients we have. James, one thing that I have noticed out here, man, and, and you know, I focus on blue collar contractors. Brokers aren't even taking the time to even have a simple conversation about what it is that their policy covers and help the insured understand it. Yeah. And just simply taking the time to do that has won me accounts. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, a simple a task is what does your general liability policy even cover? Why do yeah. I need this waiver of subrogation? Mm -hmm. it's Have wild, that basic man. conversation. But to go yeah. back to what you were saying, like getting in the door on some of these accounts, a lot of times it's, I, I've really shifted my mindset in my cold outbound prospecting. I'm real heavy on the phone. I think that it is probably the most valuable tool we have right now, especially coming out of COVID where everything was so automated and everybody's moving towards automation. People want some human interaction yep. and picking up the phone and getting on the phone with somebody. It's not as offensive as it used to be. Well, because it doesn't open, happen that much anymore. No. The number of cold calls that we get to my office, you know, this month is probably one third of what it was three years ago. Yeah. It just doesn't happen anymore. 
but but to your point, I mean, simply opening up a conversation with somebody and figuring out if they have a problem that you can solve, right? We go, we want to go into a business as a problem solver, not a problem creator. I'm not going in to find or create problems for you that don't exist. I'm going to yeah. ask you a couple questions in that conversation. What is your current agent doing that makes you happy? What are they not doing that you think could be better? If they say I'm extremely happy where I'm at and I've got nothing to complain about. Okay. You know what? I'll reach out next year and see if that's a different case. Yeah. It, but a lot of people want to go in and try to create problems that don't exist and just piss people off and not play a three to five year game on the prospecting and piss somebody off in the initial interaction. And now when they do have a problem, you're that obnoxious guy that wouldn't leave them alone the first time you called yep. rather than being someone that's going to be a center of value for them. Well, and it it is so very easy if you are a human and you approach it from a human perspective of, hey, I wonder if this person is at all concerned about the things that I'm really good at helping them with. Yep. If they're not, well, it's probably going to be a really short conversation and I'm going to thank them for their time and ask them for permission to call them back next year at around the same time. Exactly. I love being there. There's two times. And I have definitely got this first one from the David Carruthers School of Commercial Insurance. But talking to someone less than a month after renewal, I love it because mm -hmm. everything is still fresh in their minds. And the only question you have to ask is, hey, I see that you just renewed your insurance. How did that go? How was it? Yep. Did your agent or broker do a good job? Do you feel taken care of? And, and if not, then okay, wide open door. But then the, the third one is, you know, four months in advance of the renewal. I don't want to talk to them 30 days before because all of my markets are blocked. Yeah. And I, I would have to get a broker of record letter to do anything. The Dude, beautiful thing when you're six starting. Six months out now. Really? Six? Man, Dude, I thought I was a, getting in front of it with the four months thing. Our it's average an easy revenue, our average revenue is probably six or seven grand on mm -hmm. an account. So we for us, four months is probably sufficient. Uh, but I could totally see where six would be a lot more necessary for bigger, more complicated accounts or more deeply entrenched incumbents. I'm doing it just to try to make contact with them and start a conversation before the incumbent ever starts the renewal process. Oh, to yeah. see if there's to see if there's some pain that's already happened through the year that we might be able to uncover and solve before the renewal process even starts, because then I can get to market first. <laughs> no, and there's, gosh, there's nothing worse than the being the incumbent and finding out that you're blocked at markets when you start the renewal process, when you are boxed into your incumbent market. Uh, I, I don't know if you've done this before. Uh, but I, I've found it's very likely to be more successful rather than asking for a broker of record letter uh, overall to say, hey, I understand you may be inclined to show some loyalty to your current agent. Um, I would ask for the privilege of having all markets except for your current market. You can tell me over the phone, do you have any losses or not? And if you're going to certify that I don't have any losses, I will take you at your word and go to market if you're willing to give me the companies that I'm asking for, except for your current company. I'm not going to notify your agent. I'm not going to talk to your current company. I'm going to attack the rest of the market. And then if I come back with something that's better, do you commit to giving me your business? Because your, your current agent had the option to do exactly that and they haven't for whatever reason. More times than not, if they recognize that they don't even have to have that conversation with the incumbent until I deliver them something better, they're mm -hmm. a lot more likely to say yes. Yeah, I take more of, I mean, especially in the contractors out here, they're, they're so underserved and it's easier. I think in our market, it's pretty easy to win on service level rather than mm -hmm. markets and pricing. So a lot of times I've got an agreement to do business together before I'm even going to market. Sign BORs uh, are the best, man. Love it. <laughs> and uh, yeah. And I've, I've got some exclusivity on some ENS products out here that agents don't have. So I know if an account's going to agree to do business with me, I'm going to win it. <laughs> Love it. Now we can talk offline about that. Uh, I'd be curious to know what you found. And we have a couple of our own stuff in the real estate investor world that has been really nice. Yeah. But we don't have anything exclusive on the contractor side of things. Yeah, it's been a pretty nice product. I've only had access to it for probably about six months, but I've... 
I've learned what the underwriter likes there and I like, I've learned how they like their submissions. Um, so I think that's another underrated, uh, underrated thing in the market right now, man, is clean submissions and making sure mm. you're top of the stack and submitting, just submitting your risks is best in class. I mean, bro, going all the way back to a conversation that we had with Mike Creamer, who is now an executive underwriter at Chubb. Um, mm -hmm. He's the only underwriter that I've ever gotten on the show because we had to go through like four layers of compliance to get four <laughs> different people at Chubb to say yes to allowing an underwriter to come on a podcast. Uh, but it's 100%. Everything that you just said about the, the approach of the submissions, 100%. If you can win over the underwriter, your job is much, much, much easier. Dude, and it, you can even do that on incumbent carriers, right? If you have a relationship with an underwriter and you're writing that class and you look at a policy and you know that that rate's just not adding up, something had to have gone wrong in that submission, and you know that you can even get a better rate with the current carrier, that's a hell of a mm -hmm. conversation to have. Oh, yeah. Well, and asking for people to take a look off the record. And yeah. you know, if you have a great, great relationship with an underwriter, they're going to be able to give you some information that they probably wouldn't give an agent that they didn't care for. Like yeah. when you would, like for instance, there's a, a wholesaler that we work with and I was going after uh, a fire suppression company that was currently insured by that wholesaler, but they were with a carrier that you and I would both not be very fond of because they're difficult to work with and their forms aren't very good. Uh, their claims process is, is suspect. <laughs> they're very, very, very common in the contractor world. Mm -hmm. uh, may It may or may not start with a K, uh, but you know, I'll, I'll leave their names out of it. <laughs> But I went to my wholesaler and was like, hey, um, can you look in the file and tell me if this company has been sent out to the markets or is the incumbent asleep at the wheel? Like, has the incumbent shopped this or are they just parked in their current market? And I found out that they were parked in their current market. And the, the wholesaler underwriter said, hey, if you can you know, get me you know, a, an accord and a, and a BOR, uh, then I'm going to take this to the other markets. And it's like, well, wait a second. You're already insured with that wholesaler. But here's the thing. The wholesaler's got to keep their business just like you and I do. Mm -hmm. And the, the wholesaler underwriters are pragmatic just like you and I are. Now, we haven't won that account yet, but we're, we're still in progress. But having the underwriter be willing to just take a look in the file and see if there were submissions out there to the other markets and there weren't, and it's like, well, game on, baby. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I attack. I, I attack that particular carrier hard because I know I've got, I know I've got far superior markets mm -hmm. for pretty much anything they're writing in the contracting space here. And God help the client if they have a claim with that particular carrier. I've only had two claims with that carrier, and both of them have not gone well. And I end up having to apologize for stuff the carrier messed up. Yeah. So, yeah, I had a, I had a pretty large account that I won from them and it was an excavation contractor came to me a couple of years ago, a guy that I met through hunting and uh, asked me if I'd write the policy. They were getting a contract with a national home builder to do all of the pads for the homes. And, uh, I let him know right away, you know, based on what they needed, GL was going to be a minimum premium of about 50 K and didn't hear from him for a little while. Well, he called me about three months later and he's like, Hey man, can you still, uh, can you still get me that policy? I was like, yeah, did you guys finally get the contract buttoned up? He said, well, um, you know, thing was, was that, you know, we talked to you and we thought that that sounded pretty expensive. So we went to this other agent down here and they told me they could get us everything we needed for like 10 grand. Like, well, mm. I know that's not right and saw that it was with that particular carrier. And I know that that particular carrier has a tract exclusion in their policy. So I said, what yeah. happened? He said, well, they decided to go inspect our policy and saw the exclusion and that we didn't have an umbrella and uh, so on and so on. And we got thrown off the job site. And long story short, that ended up costing them $300,000 in lost wages on that contract because... They got thrown off the job site and then we had to get the new policies in place for them. And then they wanted to inspect everything before they let them back on site. So they were off yeah. site for 60 days. That incumbent agent is never going to hear from that insured again, 
And Ever. that 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 insured will tell all of their friends, don't do business with such and such agent. They screwed us over. Yep. Man. It, read the policy. Just it, read it's, the policy. It's crazy some of the stuff I see here, man. The the biggest culprit that I know I'm gonna go in and win an account is if someone tells me that they got their policy through the place that did their ROC license for them. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what I'm going to find on that policy. It's going to be written with RLI and it's going to be at minimum income and sub cost. And it's going to be written as carpentry, regardless of what industry it is. I just brought yep. a roofer over that called me doing 3 million a year in revenue. Told me they paid 1200 bucks for their GL last year. And had an ongoing claim because they tore a roof off a house and a freak storm blew through. And there's an open and, roof exclusion. And there's an open roof exclusion. And it was rated as a carpentry policy with $25,000 of revenue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Some people should not be allowed to carry an insurance license. It, it is it's, borderline criminal. That, that yeah. kind of willful misrepresentation really should get more people thrown out of the industry. 100%. I, I don't understand it. If 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 I'm a if I'm a regulator, I come in swinging a battle axe. It's like you did what? Okay, no, there is no second chance. You are out. Your license is suspended, and you can come back in five years. Yeah, I've written four five figure revenue accounts out of from that particular licensing agency this year, and they've wow. all been the same exact thing. One of them was a GC subbing out 100 percent of their work. Man, and they're on paper as a carpenter. As a carpenter with 25,000 oh of revenue and they're going to do 4 million this year. See th that it, it just boggles the mind how some of our colleagues in the industry think that certain activities are okay. I, I will never understand. It's like, there's nothing short of just open dishonesty. You are a person of very low character. If you're willing to do that sort of corner cutting, because you're not serving anyone. You're not serving your client. You're not even serving yourself. You're an idiot for cutting the corner because at the end of the day, you're opening yourself up to one, losing the account as soon as someone finds the mistakes that you allowed to be there and painting you as, you know, at best incompetent and at worst openly dishonest. It's yeah. like, how is this ever going to be a win? I don't get it. Well, and you know, my client now has that, that estimate on repair on that open roof is up to like $127,000 of damage that the owner's claiming right now. And there's no coverage. And it's going to be a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're going to be out tens of thousands of dollars of legal fees and settlements. Yep. And, and reputation. the E&O the e claim, e claim for the agent may or may not cover it. Yeah. Whew. And the what reputation damage. I mean. Soft cost you know. galore, man. Yeah. It's ugly. Look at that total ugly. cost of risk uh, um, formula, right? It's not it, just pure premium cost. Yeah, but anyone listening, I mean, you asked what the switch has been. That's been it. It's really becoming, and you know, you do it there at risk well, very well. You know, you know your markets that you're going to go after. You've got your niches that you guys attack, and you're the expert in that niche. You're the guy when it comes to to large property schedules. Yep. Right. Hundred percent, man. And what has that it, done? What's that done for you guys as far as an agency and your growth? <laughs> it it makes it difficult because it's a smaller prospect pool, but it also makes it a much, much easier because when we get the opportunities, we know precisely how it's going to go. Yeah. And we don't have to wonder where the markets are. We already know exactly where the markets are. And it's like a phone call to an underwriter saying, hey, here's here's the submission I'm about to send you. Can I get your temperature on it? And they love that stuff. Calling the underwriter before the submission? Oh, they love that. <laughs> Because it saves them so much time. Yeah, one hundred percent. That man, underwriter relationship so crucial. It really is. What What else is on your mind, man? I I know you and I could just randomly talk shop forever, <laughs> but uh, listening audience might get tired of that. Uh, any Any other things you want to point out that you're having a lot of success with? You know, man, we've hit my major points of success. I just I really encourage everyone to if if you're struggling with this hard market. It's time to invest in yourself, your education, your expertise in the industry, and don't settle into the the mediocrity that is the standard in our industry. I'm sorry to say it, but it is. And that's going to mm -hmm. offend some people, but it doesn't take much to stand out no, in our really industry. <laughs> the the, the benchmark is pretty education. low. <laughs> 
No, man, the uh, the the Patty thing. If people want to get involved with what you and Mick are doing, before, as we you know land the plane here, I want to give you an opportunity to just openly promote the the shift that you've had now, and the the collaboration, uh, the 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 heavy hitters that you guys are aligned with. And yeah, I'm an SIAA guy and I'm a big fan of my network and they do a lot of things really, really well. That being said, I recognize that a lot of other people do a great job for their clients and stakeholders. I hold Insurica in high regard, the leadership over there. And you and I have a mutual friend in, in Larry Lenny over at Insight Performance Group. Uh, he's actually one of my coaches. Uh, the the alliances that are that are coming together with people like Larry and Mick that are starting to collaborate and do things together to add value to their stakeholders. It, it's a pretty exciting time for the industry because yeah. these these groups, these people, these thought leaders used to be siloed off from each other where you had you know these camps, these tribal things over here and over there and whatever. They just wasn't really mixing. And then something like that happens with you know Larry and Mick doing something together where they're putting their collective intellectual property into alignment where people can have a conversation with Larry on one subject and a month later have a conversation with Mick. And it's like, well, these guys getting together and, you know, having these new opportunities come for retail agents. What an exciting time for, for everybody in the, the agency, you know, public agency of the PNC world. We've never had these opportunities before. It's, it's gotta be really exciting for you well, that's a dumb thing to say because you chose to join in and do it with your valuable time and energy. So let me rephrase that question. It was about to be a really dumb question. What is it about that opportunity that most excites you, that really just revs your engine so you're willing to spend some of your time and energy apart from growing your own agency? You know, man, so my heart has always been, well, I can't say always because I was a selfish bastard for a long time, but... You know, I, I had a personal journey of recovery and a lot of people coming alongside me to help me grow to where I am today. And God really put that on my heart early on in that journey that that was my purpose. And I have always been a lifelong learner and been able to learn things and replicate them very fast. And being able to take that and share it with others and help people be successful in their journey has been where my heart has been for the last 10 years. So I look at every step that I've taken along my path the last 10 years and the connections that I've been able to make and the education I've been able to obtain and see now that God's led it to this opportunity, I see where it's all come to. Yep. And being able to to join up with you know, Mix one of the most incredible human beings I've ever met. Aside from his industry knowledge, the heart that man has is <laughs> yeah. incredible. And that's really where we align the most, man, is, you know, going back to Patty. It's so crazy affordable for any agency that exists out there. And the day one knowledge that you can go in and grab out of there and take it and go write a five-figure revenue commercial account because we gave you the playbook to walk into that new business appointment and gave you the questions to ask yep. and the coverages that you needed to talk about and the way you needed to position that it's incredible. I mean, the, the lives that we've already had come to us and say you know, people that have been in the program for two, three weeks and they come and say, Oh my God, like I just went and closed my first four, even four figure revenue account. That's massive for a lot of agents, a lot of producers out there that haven't done that before. To share in that success with them, man, it's absolutely incredible. Yeah. And to hear Mick's heart in that and everything he wanted to do is to help independent agents grow and succeed. And, and, and Sorry, go ahead. And not do it from a place of greed where we're looking to, to cash massive checks off of this. And, you know, somebody can get, I took what it was there in Patty and wrote well over six figures in new business revenue this year. And it was just from some of the resources that I've gained there. Obviously, I've, I've invested in some other coaching programs in the industry. I'm I'm a Carruthers disciple myself and you know, a cu couple others in the industry that I've taken and molded my style off of. But having that practical resource in Patty to go in and, and know how to conduct that new business appointment from start to finish just was a game changer. 
And yeah. for an entire agency to come in and have that education from the agency principal, which I mean, you know, some of the people we're connected with, they're all part of the Patty Mastermind and your one man shop agency owner can come in and learn from eight figure revenue agency owners and ask them questions and they're all an open book. That in itself is extremely valuable. But now your sales producers come in and learn from producers that have produced a quarter million dollars in new business revenue. And they're teaching them how to go do it every week. And the yep. account managers come in and they're learning from the account managers that were managing these six figure revenue producers accounts. And I mean, all of it just being there in that community and being able to get away from the bullshit going on on social media where somebody asks for help and then everybody wants to come in uh, swinging their egos around to get attention. Like that's not going on here, man. This is a community that we're building together of people that just have hearts to see others succeed. And it's man. incredible to be a part of that mission. That is something that everybody can get behind. And when you see what the cost is to jump in the patty, it's a no-brainer for somebody who doesn't already have something that's very similar in function in their office. Uh, obviously, the the cost changes over time, and this podcast lives indefinitely, so I never like talking specific numbers because you know six months, a year, two years from now, somebody listening to this is going to have outdated numbers. So all I will say is as of the recording of this podcast, it is a very attainable number for even a solo operator uh, to be going after. If you're using the the content, if you're taking advantage of the resources in the Patty program, it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll throw it out what it is, man. I mean, your entire agency gets into the Patty platform for 199 bucks a month. Okay. There you go. It was your story to tell, not mine. So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, even if the price doubles in the next two years, then 400 bucks a month for a whole agency of sales coaching and training and all the resources in there, it's still a bargain. Uh, I mean, dude, especially like you go get a CLCS designation, it's $800 just for the study material Yeah. to, to get that, that designation. And this spring we'll launch that self-paced inside of Patty. It's not going to be, it won't have the CLCS designation. We're actually applying for our own certification for our course. Nice. Um, and then you have to go through the process of getting approved for continuing education with 50 states of department insurance. Um, more to come on that. <laughs> yeah. that That is not a small task at all. Um, I, I never thought much of the CLCS. And maybe that's ego because I have three other commercial certifications that are all, in my opinion, far more rigorous than the CLCS. Yeah. But it was like the the designation for people that don't want to go through a hassle to get a designation is the CIC and the CRM and the CPCU. Yeah, CPCU is self-study, but the content is rigorous in the yeah. CPCU. And you have to take nine exams. Uh, I don't know what the CLCS number of exams are, but the content that I got into was like, huh, this doesn't seem very difficult. It's not. I mean, I, I've gone through it myself and it's more of like somebody's only ever sold personal lines and doesn't even have any idea of what a GL policy looks like or what, yeah. you know, what, what products and completed operations coverage is. That makes sense because um, it's, it's so the way commercial ours is lines be coverage specialist, right? That's what it stands correct. for. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So the, the way ours is going to be structured is like each, each, uh, each policy type is going to be broken down into three, three modules and it'll be like basic 10,000 foot view and then advanced concepts and then like exposures and claim scenarios. So we're going to, we're going to dive a lot deeper into those coverage lines than the actual designation. I, I personally think it's going to be a little more comprehensive of a program, Sweet. but it's going to help, you know, that personal lines producer that's looking to shift over to commercial, it'll give them a good foundation. And then whenever we can put one of our niche playbooks in their hand. We've even got a general, if you want to be a generalist, we've got a playbook for you. Um, I don't recommend it, but if that's the route you're going to go, more power to you. Yep. But now you know the foundation of coverage. You take an artisan contractor playbook in front of a $10 million rev or revenue roofing company, you're going to be able to have an educated conversation and write that account. There you go. Love it. 
man, this is a good time for us to land the plane. Where is uh, someone needing to, to get in touch with you? What's your social media platform of choice? You know, man, I'm active on every single one of them now. Um, All right, I'm doing doing a lot of a lot of agency talk back and forth on LinkedIn. I'm posting a lot of articles on there um, in regards to, to agency rev ops. So you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, if you want to see more video, short form stuff, all the all the other platforms, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, just my name, Cody Houck, K-O-D-Y-H-O-U-K. That's where you Easy can find enough. me. <laughs> Man, I really appreciate your time. This has been a lively chat. Uh, it, it's probably about what I expected from you, sir. Uh, <laughs> lots of fun getting into the weeds with you. I definitely appreciate your time and energy today. He is Mr. Cody Houck. He is now with Patty the premier agency development institute and our website uh, there is agencydevelopment.com for anyone that wants to go check it oh, out agencydevelopment.com we'll put that in the show notes folks and that's all for this episode make it a great day and we'll talk to you soon thanks <laughs>